want to start off this morning by just showing you a short clip from the movie Kung Fu Panda. How many of you watched the movie Kung Fu Panda? I think it's one of my favorite animated films. I love the Kung Fu Panda trilogy. And he is the dragon warrior that was destined. He was chosen. He was called to be the dragon warrior. Now, what's the dragon warrior? It's the protector of the land, right? Chosen. And he wouldn't be... You know, he wouldn't have been our first pick. He probably wouldn't even have been our 10th pick. But he was called and chosen to play a special role. And let's play that clip for you. Good morning, Master. Panda. Panda, wake up. <laughs> He's quit. What do we do now, Master? With the panda gone, who will be the dragon warrior? All we can do is resume our training and trust that in time, the true dragon warrior will be revealed. Ah! What are you doing here? Ah! Hi! Hey. Good morning, Master. I thought I'd warm up a little. Huh? You're stuck. Stuck? Nah. What? Stuck? <laughs> <laughs> nah. This is one of my... Yeah, I'm stuck. Help him. Oh dear. And maybe on three. One, two. <sighs> Thank you. Don't mention it. No, really, I appreciate it. Ever. <laughs> you actually thought you could learn to do a full split in one night? It takes years to develop one's flexibility, and years longer to apply it in combat. Oh. <laughs> The only souvenirs we collect here are bloody knuckles and broken bones. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Let's get started. Are you ready? I was born ready. Oh! Oh! I'm sorry, brother. I thought you said you were ready. That was awesome. Let's go again. <laughs> I've been taking it easy on you, Panda, but no more. Your next opponent will be me. All right, yeah, let's go! Step forth. <laughs> the true path to victory is to find your opponent's weakness and make him suffer for it. Oh, yeah! To take his strength and use it against him until he finally falls or quits. But a real warrior never quits. Don't worry, Master. I will never quit! If he's smart, he won't come back up those steps. But he will. He's not gonna quit, is he? He's not gonna quit bouncing, tell you that. <laughs> You know, it's rare nowadays to see someone that is so enthusiastic to learn. Someone that's so excited to be mentored. Someone who has a teachable spirit. I love the Kung Fu Panda series because Po, I mean, he's hilarious, right? He's, he's funny. But what I love about him is that he has the right perspective. You saw his seafood trying to break him down. And he's like, I'll never quit. And every time he gets beat up, he's like, oh, awesome. It's so cool, right? And he's so enthusiastic to learn because he has a teachable and humble attitude. You know, as believers in Christ, in the same way, we should be people that are so eager to learn. People that are humble and people with an easygoing attitude. Let's be real. Some of us right now are just too uptight. Some of us are just so legalistic. Some of us want everything the way we think it should be that we can't enjoy life because we think that we know how things should happen and we don't give grace to others. But listen, a critical spirit is a spirit that is not a teachable spirit. And 
all of us should, you know, come to a point where we have to humble ourselves and admit, God, forgive me. Forgive me for sometimes having a critical spirit. Forgive me sometimes if I, if I feel like, oh, you should do it this way, or you should think that way, or you should do it this way. Because really, that is not a spirit of grace, and that is not a spirit of humility. Some of us think too highly of ourselves. Some of us think that we know everything, and some of us might be downright prideful. And that is why today I want to talk to you about what it means to be teachable. Say teachable. teachable. Now a great indicator of a sound and maturing Christian is someone that is teachable. Another word connected to being teachable is humility. Say humility. humility. You know, you can't go wrong by taking the humble approach. Say be humble or you will stumble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It's difficult to respect someone who doesn't, you know, take on humility or someone who doesn't communicate or who shows a negative attitude or someone who only wants to fly solo or someone who puts other things first before honoring the word of God or someone who is not teachable. My title for today's message is an important question that all of us should ask ourselves. And the title is, Am I Teachable? Ask yourself this question this morning and repeat it loud with me. Say, am I teachable? And in our verse today in Proverbs, we're going to see what the Bible teaches us on being teachable and how it coincides with humility, wisdom, and blessing. Open your Bibles with me to, to Proverbs chapter 9. And we're going to be reading verse 7 to 12. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7 to 12. Please stand with me one, one last time for the reading of God's word. All right, verse 7. Let's read it together. Count of three. Ready? One, two, three. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this morning, and we thank you for the opportunity, God, just to be molded by you, to be changed and transformed by you. God, this morning, give us a humble spirit. Give us a teachable spirit. We come broken and contrite before you because, God, we know that we cannot do it on our own, and we need you, God. We need you. And we need you just to breathe. We need you just to have this heartbeat. God, we need you because you are life itself. And this morning, forgive us, God, if there is times that we have been prideful before you, if there is times that we have had a critical spirit towards others, God, we pray that you would open our eyes to be changed by your transforming word of God this morning. And as your servant and as your humble vessel this morning, I Lay my life down before you and ask you to use me for your glory and your glory alone. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to share with you this morning three action steps to being teachable according to God's word. Three action steps. And to help you remember it, to help you take down the notes, because you're going to take this down, you want to share it, you want to live it. I'm going to use the acronym BAR, B-A-R, as time to raise the spiritual bar. Have you ever heard that term? It's time to raise the bar. Have you heard that before? Do you know where that derives from? If you actually do research on where that term or that saying came from, time to raise the bar, it came from track and field games, the pole vault or the high jump. And every time they would, you know, meet their personal best, they would say, you know what, raise the bar because I want to get better and better and better. So that's where that term or that saying raise the bar came from, 
from the track and field games. For us spiritually, we should always be wanting to raise the bar. As Christians, we should be always wanting to grow in maturity of Christ, to be more like him, to be transformed by his word, to be in the fellowship of his presence. So this morning, we're going to be using the acronym BAR to raise that spiritual bar. Now in verse 7, it says, He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Now, listen, the wicked man or the one who scoffs, he doesn't want to receive wisdom. He doesn't want to receive correction. The person who doesn't believe in God or the person who doesn't believe in the wisdom of God, they don't want to receive it. And if you offer that to fools and scoffers, people who want to do it their own way, they're going to reject you. But not only reject you, it might also even translate into harm. Now it says there, he who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. There's times where you're having a conversation, or maybe even it it might turn into an argument. Now, if you're in a situation like that as a believer, you need to just step, up, step away and move on. Because there's, especially in this generation, when you get into a discussion with someone, whatever it may be, whether it may be about religion, politics, uh, your viewpoints, even sports, when you talk to someone and they're very passionate about what they believe in, you're not going to really budge them just based on your opinion, right? We talked about that last week. You're not going to change people just by saying what you believe. You're going to need more than that to change someone. You're going to need facts, right? You're going to need truth to make people open their eyes to see what's going on. So that's, that's where it starts. But if you talk to someone and it just escalates and escalates, you know what's going to happen? When you try to rebuke or, or correct someone or give wisdom, they're going to reject you. And not only reject you, we're living in a generation that will harm you. You can't have a conversation anymore without someone actually start shoving you, spitting in your face. You can't even share political views. You can't even share religious views without being spit on. I mean, I watched countless videos. You know, I've seen videos of of people who are just standing there, you know, maybe they're against abortion and they're holding a sign and then someone goes and breaks their table. And it's like, what happened to freedom of speech, right? People now, because you don't agree with them, they want to inflict harm on you. So we see that, but if you teach wise people, they'll accept the truth and they'll become wiser. But if you try to teach fools, they'll reject the truth and become even greater fools. Now in verse 8, it says, do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Do not correct a scoffer. Solomon gives us here, Uh, a rule for Christian character, right? Why should we correct and rebuke when more harm than good will be the result? Avoid irritations. Wait for the favorable opportunity. Say that with me. Wait for the favorable opportunity. Because if you talk to someone who's riding on their high horse, you're not going to get through to them. But when we talk about favorable opportunity, people that are prideful before God will one day hit the ground, will one day be humbled by God. In my men's ministry back in the day, this is one of our favorite quotes, was this, humble yourself before God or you will be humbled by God. So when you talk to someone who's riding on their prideful high horse, you have to just wait Because that might not be the ideal time to speak truth to them. But there's going to be a moment when they face a situation in life where they're humbled by God. And those are the moments where you can speak to a coworker. Those are the moments where you can speak to a friend who rejects God. But when it comes to those situations in life, and all of us will go through storms of life. And those are the moments where we can share truth because that's the moment where they're actually open to it. But people that are feeling like, hey, you know, I got the job that I want. I'm making the money that I want. I got everything that I want. I don't need God. But one day, they're going to get the news and understand that life is fragile, that life is short. And that's the moment and that's the favorable situation where you can begin to share God to them. So the first action step to raising the bar, our spiritual bar, to being teachable is this. 
Be open to God's adjustments. We see in the second half of verse 8, it says, Rebuke a wise man, and what? He will love you. If you correct and rebuke someone who's wise and someone who's humble, he will love you. Verse 9, it says, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. You see the contrast between the wise man and the man who doesn't want wisdom of God? It lines up with what Jesus was saying in Matthew 13. He says this, For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. If you are a person who is humble before God, If you're someone who receives instruction and and wants more wisdom of God, God will add it to your life. But someone who rejects God will only become more foolish. They'll only fall in situations that are negative. And they're, they're not obeying God. In doing so, they're far from his will. How many of us want to be in the will of God? I want to be in the will of God. Because in the will of God, there's blessing. But the moment you turn your back on God, the moment you step away, does God still love you? Absolutely. Does God still beckon you to come back to him? Absolutely. But I want you to understand this principle and this belief. God never is the one who steps away from you. God always remains in his position calling you to come home. We're the ones who turn our back on him and walk away. And yet, he still holds out his loving arms and beckons us home. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. I'm so blessed that all of you are learners. You know how I know you're learners? Because you're here today. You're here to receive the word of God. You're engaged, you're focused, and some of you even taking notes. And th- those are the kind of people, you know, when I was in school, I wasn't a big note taker. But I will admit, people that take notes get better grades. And I will admit this, I was never a front row sitter. I would always be in the, I would always be in the back of the back of the back of the auditorium, right? So I can goof around, right? So the teacher couldn't see me. That's who I was. But I have to admit, the people that did sit in the front, they were the ones who got the best grades. They're the ones that that were able to engage and focus. And here I am in the back, you know, playing games or doodling on my, my pad, right? When people in the front are engaged. And I'm so blessed that we're in a church of humble people. You're people that are willing to be molded. How many of you uh, ever played with Play-Doh before? So tell me what happens, though, if you take Play-Doh out and you leave it on the table overnight. What's going to happen? It gets dried up, right? When the Play-Doh is not being molded, if you just leave it out, it will dry up. When we are not in God's hands and we're far from his will, what's going to happen to us? We're going to get dried up. But when we're in God's hands and he's molding us, We're constantly being molded, and we're not going to get dry. I don't know how many Play-Doh containers I've thrown away. I don't know how many Play-Doh pieces I have vacuumed. I'm like vacuuming out here. Oh, that's a lot of Play-Doh being vacuumed because my kids sometimes will leave it out. You know, I'm blessed to know that you guys are moldable people in the Lord's hands. Can I get an amen? amen? I love this quote by Adam Clark. It says, literally, give to the wise and he will be wise. Whatever you give to such, they reap profit from it. They are like the bee. They extract honey from every flower. You have to be always willing to learn. You have to be people where you, even though you know something well, you know there's always room to learn in. For example, if I play an instrument, I know that there's countless people better than I in whatever instrument I play. You know, I I love to just watch people play and pick up little things that they do. Everyone has their own style. Everyone has their own capability. So whenever I see someone play, I just love to watch them, right? I like to take the humble approach and like say, hey man, how'd you do that? 
You know, can you teach me? Because it's important to always learn. And as a Christian, as a child of God, it's important to always keep learning. Don't settle for where you are, but God has called you to be something great. Look at this picture here of Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. Now, this is based on opinion, but if you ask me, I think these are the two greatest players to ever play the game. And my, many of you might say Steph Curry. <laughs> But I think these two changed the game of basketball. And if you ask Michael Jordan, who most resembles you as the greatest player of all time? He's not going to say LeBron. He's not going to say James Harden. He's going to say Kobe Bryant. Now, when Kobe was a rookie, he, he followed Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was like a hero to him. And then when he got into the NBA, you see this far left picture here where he's talking to Jordan when he was, when he was young. You know what he's asking him here? Because they interviewed him. They said, what were you asking Jordan when you were talking to him? He said, how do you do your turnaround fadeaway? <laughs> how, how do you do that? Like, what's the secret? And Jordan told him, it's all in the legs. When I make that fadeaway, I feel my defender with my legs. And I know where he's at. When I spin off of him, I could feel him off my hip. And I use my legs. And that's what he's talking to him about. And you see how Kobe imitated Jordan there, right? In the pictures. And throughout the years, Kobe would call Michael Jordan and say, hey, man, I need some advice. People, a lot of people don't know that. Because obviously when you're professional, you don't always want to just like say, hey, yeah, he's the greatest player of all time. But now that Kobe was rising as one of the greatest players, he had to keep that professionalism. But he looked up to Michael Jordan as a mentor, as someone to follow. So don't always think that you're, you're the best and that you could stay where you are, but always succeed, always grow, always learn. And as a Christian, we should always want to grow, always want to learn, get more of the word of God in our life, be around people who are mature in Christ, be around people who really get it. Be around genuine Christians who live that kind of lifestyle. Be around marriages that are healthy. Be around parents who parent well. Because the more you surround yourself with people, the more that you're going to learn from them. The more you're going to gain wisdom as a child of God. Can I get an amen? Let's give the Lord praise and glory. So the first action step to being teachable, to raising the bar, is being open to God's adjustments. And some of us have to say this morning, God, adjust me. You need to adjust me, right? You need to adjust my life. Look at this soundboard here. I remember when I was young and I, I started playing with the soundboard before I was doing worship. And, you know, when I would adjust something, one of my mentors said, no, 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 no. Okay, so you see here, you see high, medium, and low. You're going to have to adjust it by the sound of the instrument. So if you hear it too peak, peaking too high, you're going to put the highs down. If you need a little bit more low end, you want to put up the lows and, and mids. Now, I could have said, look, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. But no, I understood that I don't know everything. And sometimes, many of you, if you just looked at, uh, at a big uh, soundboard, right, now, if you look at the soundboard, some of you would be clueless looking at it. It's like it's just a bunch of buttons, right? It's just a bunch of buttons. And sometimes life feels that way. You look at life and you're like, it's, it's a lot of buttons. There's a lot of adjustments that have to be made, right? There's a lot of things. I need help. In life, we have to say, God, I need help. I need you to help me adjust my life, the areas of my life, because I want to be teachable, and I want to raise that bar to be teachable. Amen? The second step to being teachable, to raising that spiritual bar, is to always start with God. Say, always start with God. In verse 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, Proverbs is such a practical book. It's a book of wisdom. But when we talk about fear, the fear of the Lord is not the kind of fear of terror, right? You know, when you're a kid, especially Filipino families, they would say, don't go there, there's a momo. You know, momo is like a monster, right? And I don't know why uncles and aunts would, would, would scare kids like that, traumatize them. Oh, don't look in the closet, there's a momo there. 
Right? Who will say that? There's a monster that's going to get you. There's dark there, huh? You know, that's how Filipinos babysit. You know, uncles, uncles and aunts will be sitting on the couch watching a TFC, which is the Filipino channel. And instead of watching the kid, they just tell them, hey, you just stay here. Do not go there. There's a momo there. Do not go there. There's a momo there. Do not go there. There's a momo there. You stay here. Okay? There's no momo here. Only uncle. That's how Filipinos babysit, right? But see, fear that we're talking about is not a terror kind of fear. A scary kind of fear. But the fear we're talking about is a real sense of awe. A real sense of honor and reverence. So when it says the fear of the Lord, the honor, the reverence of the Lord, when we revere God, when we honor God, when we obey God, is the beginning of what? Wisdom. We honor God because he's holy. We honor God because he's just. We honor God because he's righteous. We honor him because he's creator of all. And wisdom has a starting place. And it's in the recognition and honor of God. This means that those who don't recognize and honor God, they fall short of wisdom in some way or another. Whatever you do, you always start with God. Starting a business, you start with God. Starting a ministry, you start with God. Beginning your marriage, you start with God. Just had a baby, start with God. You start with God in every situation. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And we should always start with God. Look at this next picture of this baseball field and this first base. Now, this guy hit the ball. He was rounding first base, and he was going to go to second base. And his team scored a run in the process when he hit the ball. And when he got to second base, he was like so fired up. He's like, yeah, he's pointing at his, his team. He's like, yeah, we did it. You know, we scored a run. Now we're, we're ahead. We're beating the other team. He was so excited. But one of the players on the other team took the ball. And while he was standing on second base, he tagged him like that. And the umpire said, he's out. And the guy on second base was like, what? What are you talking about? How am I out? I'm standing on this base. The umpire said, you didn't touch first base. When you ran to first base, you didn't touch it. You ran around it. And in doing so, you're out. When it comes to God in our life, you have to hit first base first. And first base is starting with God. You always have to start with God. Look at this quote by G. Campbell Morgan. It says, we are ever beginning. Every morning we start afresh. Every task we take up is a new start. Every venture in joy or an effort must have its commencement. Then let every beginning be in the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And it leads in the way of wisdom. You know, we were talking about vacations earlier, about some families going on vacation right now. You know what I do and my family do when we go on vacation? We always start with God. Before we take off for our trip, whether we're driving or flying, we, we just stop and say, okay, let's pray. And we say, God, bless our trip that we're about to take. We pray that we would have time to, to relax, to rest, but most importantly, that we'll have time to appreciate the blessings that you've poured into our life. And in the moment of our vacation, that as we look around at all of your beautiful creation, we will draw closer to the wonderful God that you are. Always start with God. And I tell you, when you start with God, God's going to bless your path. He'll bless you. And I tell you, we need to always start with God. Turn to your partner and say, start with God. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Knowing God is where we find understanding. How many of us need direction in life? How many of us right now need clarity on something, anything? How many of us right now need wisdom on making a decision about something? Listen, if you know him more, you will grow in him more. And when we pray to God, God, I want you to teach me. God, 
I want you to stir up my heart, my desire to do your will. And as I seek you and as I know your will, I'm going to understand this whole process. I'm going to discern what's going on. You're going to give me wisdom and clarity and direction as I make the next decision. As I make the next step, you're going to give me clarity and direction. Because I tell you, God promises you this. That he will give you clarity. And many times you, you know, we live in a generation where we want everything instantly. But I tell you, faith doesn't work that way. No matter how much you try to want to manipulate it, how much you want to change, you can't change the way God does things. Because he does it because he knows what's best. So listen, whatever situation right now, you, you want an answer, right? God, I just want an answer right now. I don't want to wait a month. I don't want to wait a year. I don't want to wait five years. I want an answer right now. Can I get an amen? How many of us want answers right now? But I tell you, it doesn't always work that way. Can God give you an answer right now? He could. If he says the time is right. If the timing is wrong, God will say no. If the request is not right, God will say no. But if the timing is right and the request is right, God will say go. And God will say, I will bless that. But you've got to be on my timing, says the Lord. You, You have to have the right request, says the Lord. We need to always start with God. And we need to understand that when we ask God, he will give us understanding. He will give us wisdom in every decision we make. And in, and in the process, he's going to give us grace to endure it. Trust me, there's a lot of things in my life I wish could just be answered right now. But it's in that process that you're leaning on God. It's that process that you're clinging on to God. And it's in that process that you are drawing closer to him. And when you draw close to him, when your heart is changed, then God is going to swoop in and he's going to start to change your situation. And sometimes God might not even change your situation because maybe sometimes God, the only thing that God was really after was changing your whole perspective. Maybe you're in a relationship right now and you're like, God, when is this relationship finally going to hit smooth sailing? When is this relationship going to actually happen? right? When is it going to work out the way I, I, I hoped it to be, right? And many times we want that to happen a certain way, but what if God is saying, no, son, no, daughter. So instead of changing this situation, he's trying to change your perspective, understanding that this guy is not good for you, or this woman is not good for you. Whatever situation we're in, many times God just wants to change your perspective, And sometimes God will want to change your perspective and then he also will change the situation. It's all based on what God's will is. But one thing I know for sure is that as people of God, we should just say, God, not my will, but your will be done, right? Not my will, but your will be done. I need clarity. And where does it start? It starts with God. It starts with honoring God, obeying God, fearing God. With that comes wisdom. It also says, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. How many of you want understanding today? You ever get a point in your life where you didn't get something, and maybe days or weeks pass by, and finally you go, I get it. It makes sense now. Like something clicks, like a light bulb goes off, right? Light bulb. You're like, I get it. There's, there's, this is a beautiful thing when you have understanding. But what saddens me in this generation, in many churches today, we've lost reverence for God's word. And when we lose reverence and honor for God's word, when we lose reverence for this, we will get lost. When we start to just to beef up everything around us, but we start to neglect the word of God, we start to lose reverence for God himself. Because when we do those things, the word of God takes a back seat to the giveaways, to the performances, to the show, the effects, the music. You know, many churches right now, they emphasize talent over anointing. 
If you look at many churches today, they, they don't want just like a blend of people on stage. They want people only that fits their description. Oh, you have to fit within the 20 to 30 range. <laughs> you have to dress uh, this certain way, right? But I believe in having a church that's a family church, that's, that's blended. It shows that we can be united, and that's a beautiful thing. That's where anointing starts pouring in. You know, many churches today, too, are, are trying to get people through the doors by giving them things. Hey, come to church. We're going to give you a gift card. We're going to give you a free Starbucks gift card. Just come to church. So they start to go to church not because they honor God, but because they honor Starbucks, <laughs> right? Come to church. We're going to give you a Five Guys gift card. Instead of honoring God, they're honoring five guys. And we're turning the church into what Jesus, what upset Jesus. Remember why Jesus was turning over tables and letting go of the animals in front of the, of the temple? Do you remember why? Why was Jesus so upset? What did he say for you guys that know that passage? He went in front of the temple and he was so burning with a holy anger. And he started flipping tables over. He released all the animals. He, he started clearing out the tables. You know why? What did he say? You turned my father's house basically into a flea market. This was supposed to be a house of worship. This was supposed to be a house of prayer. And you turned it into Berryessa a flea market. Right? You see, there's a guy selling churros right there. <laughs> And we turned, America has turned the church into a marketplace when it needs to be a house of God. Someone give them praise in the house of God. You know, an ego will kill the anointing of God. Sure, you can have a great time. Sure, you can get your ears tickled. And sure, you can, you know, be entertained. But we don't come to church to be entertained. We come to church to be changed. Come on now. Listen, surface level worship, surface level preaching will only lead to surface level transformation. There's no substitute for the anointing of God. There's no substitute for the transformation of God. There's no substitute for real life change. And that's why you see people who are still struggling. They're like, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I go to church every Sunday. But what are you receiving? Are you only receiving surface level material? Are you only receiving surface level transformation? Because if that's all you're receiving, that's all you're going to get. But if you come to church and say, God, I come with a teachable heart. I don't want surface level. I want you to hit to the deepest part of my heart and my soul. God, your word says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the very heart, piercing to the deepest part of my life. I tell you, the church, we can't win families the way God intended us to if we just imitate the world. We're not supposed to imitate the things of the world. Oh, come to church. It's a big YMCA. I heard one time a friend who goes to one of these huge mega churches, and I'm not dissing mega churches, but this is what I do diss. He went up to a guy, he goes, Hey, why don't you come to my church? You know what? We have a full size gym. He didn't even say, Why don't you come to church, bro? You know, you need God in your life, you need direction. No, he says, Come to my church. We got a full gym, we can work out together. I'm like, Dude. You, you, need to, you need to change your approach, right? Hey, come to my church this Sunday. We're giving out free movie tickets. Come on by. So what are they going to do? They're going to come to the door, get a free movie ticket, and then walk out the door. Thanks. I'm going to go to the movies right now, right? We're not supposed to entice people just to get them to the door. It starts by loving on them. It starts by loving on them outside of church. You shouldn't even have to say that you're a Christian. You shouldn't even have to say that you go to church. But in your, with your coworker, maybe your coworker came in, and you know that conversation you have after the weekend? What's the question they always ask? What's the question you always, they always ask when you get into work and it's a Monday? How's your weekend, right? And some people go, it was good. 
And other people will open up and say, oh, it was terrible, man. Uh, me and my wife got into a big argument and, you know, we're not in good terms right now. We're not even talking for the past couple of days. It's those moments as Christians where you say, you know what, can I pray for you? It's those moments where you share the love of God. But how can we win souls for God if we imitate the world? We need to be people that want to be challenged by God. Listen, his word is precious. It's the very instrument that teaches us more about him and his will for our lives. How many of you have ever written a love letter? How many married couples right now wrote love letters to each other? Raise your hands. You know, I, I always tell this. I would always write love letters because this is before texting. And th this is when pagers were in. But you remember pagers? You have to, it's a code. You know, 143637, right? Yeah. And you would, you would punch all those numbers in like, dee, 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 dee. oh, he loves me. Oh, she loves me. You know, you, you would look at your pager. Those are the times where you write letters, and, and, and some, some people can be creative in folding those letters a certain way, right? Real creative. And even has like those little tabs that you pull, and the whole thing opens up. There's like little doodles in there. I would, I would always write, I think my wife Leonie has still a box of my letters. And, uh, you know, spray some cologne on there. <laughs> CK1, and she's like, oh, smells just like him, right? But to know someone, you actually learn a lot more about people reading letters. Sometimes when you're on the phone, some of you have to agree with me on this. Remember you're on the phone back in the days and you're falling asleep. Like, no, no, you go first. No, 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 I'm, st I'm still here. I'm, st I'm still here. Are you, st are you tired? No, no, no. How about you? Are you sleepy? No, no. And it's just silent just to be on the phone together, right? How are you going to get to know each other like that? Uh, are you sleepy? Uh, like one hour of doing this. Uh, you, no, you go first. No, you. No, you. Uh. You can't learn about someone by doing that, but by writing letters. And this is God's love letter to you. And the more you get into God's word, the more you're going to fear him and honor him, and you're going to have wisdom and understanding. Look at verse 11 with me. For by me your days will be multiplied, and the years of life will be added to you. God says wisdom brings benefits to those who receive it. Finding wisdom starts with the fear of the Lord, and it's going to be rewarded. So the last action step, right, we talked about being open to God's adjustments. We talked about always starting with God. Number three, third action step to raising the spiritual bar to be teachable is reverence and reward. Say reverence and reward. So it says in verse 11, for by me... Your days will be multiplied, and the years of life will be added to you. When you obey God, you know, I always tell God this. I actually pray this every day. I say, God, give me a life long enough where I can fully fulfill what you want me to do on earth. And sometimes I always had this thought process like, God, if I'm disobedient to you, are you going to cut my life short? Because it's almost like, am I being useful to you, God? But I want to do as much as I can for the kingdom of God so that you can extend my life with wisdom and blessing so that I could serve my family, so that I could serve my church family. Because a lot of us might have that anxiety of, how long am I actually going to live? Can I live long enough to enjoy life but not too long where I start suffering, right? I don't want to live till like 110 years old. But can I live a life long enough to serve you? And God says here, when you revere God, it says your days will be multiplied and the years of life will be added to you. Reverence before God translates into reward from him. Verse 12, if you're wise, you're wise for yourself. Solomon is telling us, yes, receive wisdom for the benefit of yourself. Don't feel like you're selfish getting wisdom from God because what God is telling us, he's saying, saying, yes, you seek the Lord. You seek his word so that you can have wisdom on your life for yourself so that you can set an example to your marriage, to your family, to those around you that God is a God of blessing, that God is a God of wisdom. 
But see, what people do is they only want wisdom just so they can show it off. There's two categories, all right? There's one who honors God because they love God. And there's the second person who just wants to become spiritually mature. Don't be someone who only just wants to be spiritually mature. Because I tell you this, I'm not after wisdom alone. I'm not after spiritual maturity alone. That's secondary. I'm after Jesus. I'm pursuing God. I'm pursuing Christ. And when you pursue Christ, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what? All these things will be added unto you. When you seek God, all these other things will be taken care of. But you got to seek him first in all you do. I want Jesus. And when I have Jesus, I have it all. But then it says in the last part of this verse, and if you scoff... If you mock God, you will bear it alone. If you mock the wisdom that people offer, you're going to be alone without God's covering, without God's favor. And we know what kind of road that leads us on, a road of bitterness, a road of emptiness. So what do we learn from our passage today to raise a spiritual bar? Number one, be open to God's adjustments. Say that with me. Be open to God's adjustments. Number two, always start with God. Say, always start with God. And number three, reverence and reward. And I want to close with this this morning. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For this is what the high and lofty one says, the one who lives forever, the one whose name is holy, God says this, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. The answer lies in this meaning of contrite. Say contrite. Now what does contrite mean? The Hebrew word means to be humbled, to be broken before God. To be cast down. It literally means to be crushed to powder. Why? Why would God tell us that? Why would God say, I am the high and lofty one who, who sits on the throne of heaven, but I'm also one who sits on the heart of those who are broken and contrite. Why is he saying that? I'm also with the one whose spirit is crushed like powder. Because sometimes in life we build our pride before God. And God says, what you build is not going to stand the test of time, but what I build in you will. And when you come to God with a, with a clean slate, when you come to God with a clean altar and say, God, build me back up. God, break me down and then build me back up. Sometimes you ever see kids put something together and you laugh. And you go, that's not going to That's not going to stay put. Right? It's going to fall apart. Because adults, you have a greater understanding of how to put things together. And you see kids put a project together, and they're like, that's not going to work. That's going to fall apart. That's how we look like before God. We say, God, look at this. And God's like, A for effort, son. A for effort, daughter. But that's not going to hold up in life. And God says, but I'm with you for those who are contrite in spirit. How many people like to build here? Build stuff. Now, for you that understand construction and building, if you built something, I was watching a video the other day of this, this family who bought a home in Las Vegas, and it was a brand new home. Everything was just off. The counter, the counters were leaning. The, the, the crown molding was off. The, the faucet that was for the bathtub didn't even reach the bathtub, so when you turn it on, it, it wets on top of the the bathtub and then they lifted up they're trying to fix their counter they lifted it up and inside there was all this trash bottles cigarette buds and they were complaining to the people who built these homes they're like we we want you guys to come in here and fix this if you're not going to pay us back you need to fix this right you know i'm someone who loves to watch like hgtv like people who repair and renovate homes because it's, it's not my gifting, but I appreciate those people that do. They can tear down a whole kitchen and rebuild it. 
They can tear down uh, and gut out, you know, bathrooms and then make it look nice. But what I really love is more than just like the renovation inside a house. What I really love is when I see them tear down a whole house and then build it back up. That's just amazing. I mean, those guys are gifted. They make it look so easy. But listen, what God is saying, I want you to be broken before me. I want you to clean that area. I I don't want the house. I don't want the building. I want the site. And when you have that site, I will build on it. I will build a foundation that will last until eternity. I will build on that. And if you have a humble and teachable spirit and you say, God, I'm clean before you. God, I'm open before you. God, I'm ready for you to build on my house, on my life. He's going to correct. He's going to revive. He's going to repair. He's going to renovate. He's going to restore and build on your life. Can we humble ourselves before him today? Can we ask him for forgiveness for our pride today? Can we start with him? Can we honor him? Can we revere him today? Let's pray. Lord, we honor you this morning. And we know, Lord, that to raise the spiritual bar in our life, we need to be open to your adjustments. We need to always start with you in every situation, in every circumstance. And that we need to show you reverence We need to honor you. And with that reverence comes with your response of reward. Teach us, Lord, to come before you every day to understand that everything that we have has been given by you. That every good gift comes from the Father. Lord, make us teachable. Take away our critical spirit. Take away our pride. For we ask it in the loving name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen.